Word of God, which we want to base our meditation this morning, is in Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parents as well as the child, both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear you, Israelites, is my way unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because of the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. Because they consider all the offenses they have committed and turn away from them, that person will surely live. They will not die. Yet the Israelites say, The way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. Dear friends in Christ, start with a trivia question this morning. Who are the three men in the fiery furnace? Not their Babylonian names, what their mother named them. Because most of us might remember it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that's not what their mothers named them. That's the names they got changed to when they became Babylonian civil servants. And they got those names just like Belteshazzar. Why we still know he's really called Daniel might be because the book of the Daniel is labeled that. But when he became a civil servant for the Babylonians, he got changed to Belteshazzar. And his three friends were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But their mothers knew them as Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. How many of you got it? I had to look it up again myself. I know the story well. Three men in fiery furnace, yet there's four of them in there, and nobody burns up, and even some of the guards die because of the heat. And obviously Daniel, I still remember the stories of him in the lion's den and those other things. Well, that's where we are today in this book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is dealing with the people who are complaining about God's unfairness. And quoting that quote from God's word itself, the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Meaning, how come we're getting punished for what our parents did? This isn't fair. God's not fair. God's wrong. Now, the other day in catechism class, I said to the kids in catechism, I said, you realize God is unfair. And they all gave me this look like, okay, where's Pastor Crackle going with this one? Because he really doesn't want to say that out loud. Lightning bolts may came through this fellowship hall roof, and we may all fry if he says that again. I'll say it again. God is unfair. We want God to be unfair. If God was fair with us, we'd all go to hell. We don't want that. We like God being unfair. We like God being unfair by sending his son, Jesus, to die in our place and get punished for our sins so we will never have to get punished for them. And we get to go to heaven for free. That's not fair. That's right. We don't want God to be fair with us. We want his mercy. We want his grace. But did the people at this time have a legitimate complaint or a right to say this? Because in some ways the circumstances are their parents' faults. God had gotten frustrated with their hard-heartedness. The Jewish people did sort of whatever they wanted. They didn't listen to the basic commandments. They were immoral. They were following, worshiping even some... You know, it's one thing to commit adultery. It's one thing to steal. 
But these people couldn't even keep the first commandment. I mean, think of that. I'm pretty sure, just like I was pretty sure you might not know who Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were, I'm pretty sure if I go to your house, I will not find a statue of Buddha and incense burning at this moment. And I'm pretty sure I will not find evidence of other idols in your house that you have little altars set up to and that you worship them. And you follow them and make them like, well, on Sunday we go to that Christian thing and the other six days of the week we worship this, these other idols. They were doing this with the Baal and the Molech and the Asherah. And some of these religions were a little bit more fun than Judaism. I'll give you that because of what they got to do when they went to their temples. But God had said, enough! You, you think I'm okay with this. Like, if you, if you come and do some of the rituals that I've commanded you to do, that sort of covers up all the other sins you're doing, and no. And to discipline you, I'm going to allow the Babylonians to come down here, as Jeremiah kept prophesying to them, and conquer you, and take you into exile and put you as refugees throughout the Babylonian Empire. Well, Jeremiah can't be right because God chose us to be his people. We're his chosen ones, and the Savior can't come unless we're here. Because the Savior has to come through the line of David, and if the line of David is messed up and he's taken away, then God is not able to keep his promises. So since we know God has to keep his promises, he needs us. No, he doesn't. He doesn't need you. He can still keep his promises without all of you. Oh, God, in his goodness, also had prophesied through Jeremiah that he would allow them to be conquered. He would allow them to be dispersed among the Babylonians. They would live as exiles throughout that empire. But because he was going to keep his promise that in 70 years he would bring them back so that the Messiah could come to save all the world from their sins. This is what Ezekiel's dealing with. They didn't know exactly the timeline that God had, though he gives them that number 70, but he doesn't, they don't know when that timeline starts. Did it start with the first wave of refugees, or did it start with the destruction of Solomon's temple? Because the first wave of refugees was in 605 B.C. That's when Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah get taken from their families. They're in their teens. They're young adults. And the reason they were taken, because they were from noble families, and they were smart kids. They tested out well. And the Babylonians said, we want them, and we're going to train them for civil service. They're going to help us run the government. They're going to be our administrators. They're going to be helping us do what's necessary to keep this government thriving and well. And so if you know those, some of those stories about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they stood up for not eating the bad food and said, give us a chance. And then you know some of the other things about when he was told not to pray, and he prayed anyway, which is what got him in the lion's den. And it's what got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fire furnace because they would not bow down to the other idols. We also have the man Ezekiel. The man Ezekiel who was taken away in a different wave of refugees. In 597, he's with another wave of refugees that were taken and used in different places. But he isn't really a prophet of God yet. He was a priest, but he wasn't a prophet of God until four years later when God called him and said, I've got a job for you to do. You need to be the pastor of these refugees. You need to keep their spirits up. You need to preach to them about why they're being disciplined so they stop doing those things wrong, so I'll be happy to take them back to the promised land. And I also want to give you the, have you give them some hope. But at this point, when we're still in chapter 18, because Ezekiel's prophecies go over 48 chapters, when we're still in chapter 18, he's still dealing with the whiners. And I call him that because that's what my father did whenever I came and asked for something the wrong way. Maybe you had a parent like that. If I came and simply asked for something straight out, that this is what I wanted and why I thought I should get it, I still might not get a yes answer, but it was better than if I, stop whining. Ask for something like a man. I'm only 12. Ask for something like a man. No whining. Don't ask for things whining. In fact, if you even need it, and I think you deserve it, but you whine, you're not getting it. So I see Ezekiel being told by God, tell him to stop whining. 
But on the one hand, I see their complaint. It's valid. Why are the young people in Babylon? Why have they been taken from their neighborhoods? Why have they been taken away from their schools? Why have they been taken away from their friends? Because they didn't all go to the same places. They got spread out through all three, four hundred miles. Oh, 1,200 square miles of Babylon. It's not our fault. The parents did it wrong. Just don't let them whine. Yeah? Things aren't as the way they were before. But you're alive. You're free. You're not in slavery. You're just living somewhere else. And the children of Israel, during this time period, they prospered. The Jews lived so well that when the time of exile was over in 536 B.C., because Cyrus with the Persians had conquered the Babylonians, told the Jews, I want you to all move back. They wouldn't. They liked it there. They were having a good life. That place has been destroyed. That place is more desert than when we're, where we're living now. We don't want to move back to Jerusalem. We don't want to move back to Judah. We got it nice. God had blessed them too well. <laughs> so you needed Ezra and Nehemiah to try and get the people to listen to God and saying, he wants you to move back. Oh, send somebody else. I'm doing fine here. I like where I'm at. I like my life now. So those people whined that they had to go back to the same people that the other people whined about about having to leave. It's a good thing we don't behave this way today. Not at all. <laughs> Why do I focus on problems more than blessings? Well, blessings don't need to be fixed. So I'll understand the logic of that. I don't have to fix my blessings. There's nothing I need to make better with my blessings. If I've got something in the house that's working well, like say right now the refrigerator, nothing's wrong with the refrigerator, so I don't count the refrigerator as a blessing right now. There's nothing wrong with my vehicles right now. So they're not a problem. So I don't think of my vehicles as a blessing, my Subaru or my Toyota truck. I don't count them as blessings because there's nothing wrong with them. I don't have to think about them. But the stationary tub faucet in the basement, which keeps leaking, and I don't want to try and change this because I looked at that. I looked at it. I know that that stationary tub is this deep. You know where the bolts are to unhook that faucet? And what I got to do to try and get either my hand up there or some special device and how much I got to spend to get that done. So right now it's leaking. I just shove it to the side so we don't hear it drip. And if it really annoys me, I just go under the sink and turn them both off. There, it won't leak anymore because it won't work. But it's on my mind. I'm dealing with it. Because I know when I finish that one, the sink in the kitchen is next. I got a list. Got a list of things that you need to do? Got a list of problems in your house? Do you got a list of blessings in your house? No, not so much. So I need this lesson today. I need this reminder to think about my blessings. I don't need to wait, or I shouldn't wait till Thanksgiving Day to finally do that and count the blessings that I have. And God didn't like the whining either. He says, I blessed you. You're my people. Yeah, you're in exile right now, but you're still my people. I know who you are. That's what Ezekiel's main message was. God knows who we are. He knows where we are, and he still wants us to live in heaven with him for eternity. Now there's parts of Ezekiel where he compares them to the other nations. The Babylonians aren't going to end up in heaven unless some of them converted, and some did, but very few. The Persians weren't going to end up in heaven because unless some of them converted, and there were very few, but most of them did not. You're still my people. You still know who I am. We still have a relationship. You may not like everything in your relationship. You might not like all of your problems. But I'm still giving you blessings, and I'm still loving you, and I want you to end up in, in heaven for eternity. And he uses some examples there about simply about the way of the Lord is not just. If a righteous person turns away from their righteousness and commits sin, they'll die for it. 
Because of the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. He puts before them just the basic logic. If your parents did not learn in this exile to change their ways, to repent, change, and want a relationship with me again, they're not going to end up in heaven. But the person who may have sinned, did sin, repented of their ways, wants a relationship with me, they're going to live forever. Jesus told that little story in the gospel lesson about the two sons. The one son, he said he would do it, but didn't. The one son said he would do it, but didn't. Who listened to the father? And they had the obvious answer. That doesn't mean we thumb our nose at God and still do what he says. Don't do that. <laughs> what does God want from us? He wants us to say yes and also do it. Very logical, very fair. And yet at the same time, what God still gets us back to, just like what Jesus was trying to get at with that story, is that when he said the, test, the prostitutes figured it out, the tax collectors figured it out, they're not going to save themselves. But if they repent of their ways and look to a Savior for unfair, free salvation, they'll get it from God. And that's what's good about when I think about some of my problems. Or if I focus on some of those problems too much. And even once in a while in my prayers, I may even get a little whiny. God is still loving and forgiving. Because above all of those little mistakes and medium mistakes that I make, I'm not stupid enough to think I don't need a Savior. I need Jesus to forgive me. I need the Father to forgive me. I need the Holy Spirit to help me believe it. So I can say, I'm going to heaven because God is unfair. He does not treat me as I deserve. He treats me with love and mercy. That's why you and I are here again today to say, thank you, God. Just as I am without one plea, chief of sinners though I be, I'm going to heaven. And you know you're going to heaven because God says so. That's where, when I look at some of these things with other, other situations, when God gives rules like to the Jews in the Old Testament, he says, tells the Jewish people, don't eat ham. Tells them, don't eat shrimp. Why? Now I know there's some people get logic in there because you couldn't cook pig correctly in those days and people would get sick from it. The Babylonians figured out how to cook pig correctly and not get sick from it. No, it's just as God said so. If you love me, don't do this. If you love me, do this. In our New Testament thing, when people ask me, what about homosexuality? What about people being born that way and everything else? Yep, I understand your logic. But I'll go back to say, what does God say? God says, don't do this. So why don't we do it? Because God says so. Why am I going to heaven? Because God says so. Now when my dad said, you can't have something, I knew why I couldn't have it. Sometimes I was stupid enough to argue and get, try and get some logic in there, and sometimes he was patient with that. But still, most of the time when I would frustrate him, he still came back to, because, you can fill in the words, I said so. But if I got to do something, why did I get to do it? Because he said so. God's got the gift of salvation all ready for us. A wonderful place to live for eternity in heaven all ready for us. And why can I know it's true? Because it's God who says so. Amen. Please arise.